How are we doing? It is great to be here. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. It's nice to see so many familiar faces in this audience. I must first, I must first say that over the last couple of years, we've gotten a couple of amazing awards um, at Color of Change. And each time, I'm oftentimes embarrassed because um, I get the privilege and pleasure of working with and oftentimes representing the most talented, um, creative, and brilliant team um, in the nonprofit, in the social justice movement. And so these awards are it's not about me, but about not just the staff at Color of Change, not just the board, but the members, the 1.5 million members who every single day take actions to engage on the issues that matter the most. You know, I, um, I look out in this audience and I think um, that many of us um, have been fighting these fights around um, putting two things together, media and justice. Uh, from the FCC in Washington to Airbnb and Facebook in Silicon Valley, to reality TV in Hollywood, to Fox News in Madison Avenue in New York City, to ESPN and to every football player and football field in this country. We have a, um, my, my papers are back and forth. I'm saving some uh, trees here. You know, when I, um, when I first got to GLAD back in 2005, um, the GLAD Awards was honoring the United Church of Christ uh, for the uh, Still Speaking campaign. Um, it made me think a lot um, as a 25-year-old who had taken this job at GLAD. I'd come from the racial justice movement. I had a business card that now said gay on it. My um, grandmother, who once told people what I did, sort of said, oh, yeah, he's still doing the activist thing. Um, the Still Speaking campaign made me think a lot about what it means to break through with a message how the core of that success is often putting two ideas together that people aren't just putting together very often, the God and welcome, gay and Christian, words that many in power didn't want people to hear together in one breath or see together on any sign, words that people profited from keeping apart, and words that rescued so much hope for so many people by putting them together. We put some words together ourselves at Color of Change when we put together words like net neutrality and civil rights. When we put together words like internet freedom and no black sellouts. Words like corporate power versus black power. Words can have transformative power when they are, have people behind them when there is something at stake behind them. And the work of the UCC, if there is one lesson from that campaign and so many more, is about taking charge of the special response that we have to those who love justice to change the conversation so that it actually leads to justice. Whenever we draw our strengths from, we know that change doesn't happen on its own. We have the gift of strength that we can use to lift heavy things. But I think one of the biggest lifts that we have in this moment is not just the people power that we need to mobilize, to change the institutions over our lives, but changing the narrative and the conversation about how we actually talk about it. So often in this country, when we talk about inequality and injustice, racism and poverty, we talk about those things somewhat as inconveniences, as unfortunate, almost like a car accident. And as a result, we work to build empathy for the people who are most impacted. Right? How often have we had the conversations that we need to build empathy for those who are impacted by systems? And I don't think empathy is a bad thing, but I urge us all to think about not how we just build empathy, but how we build power. 
Because unfortunately, over and over, when we leave people at empathy, when we leave people at unfortunate, and we don't move them to power and unjust, we get the type of solutions that are not scalable for the change that we actually need. When people saw LGBT couples not being able to see their partners in the hospital as unfortunate, and they worked to build empathy without power, people said that's sad that those couples can't see each other. Let's give them domestic partnership or civil unions. When people saw, see children in inner city schools that are failing, and they say, that's unfortunate. We need to build empathy for those children. That's when we get big corporations having service days to clean up those schools while lobbying for the, against the policies that would actually change public education in the process. When we build empathy for people who have been trapped in an unjust system of mass incarceration in this country, we get people working to do reentry programs without dealing with the structures and the systems that put people behind bars in the first place. If we are not doing the work every single day to deal with inequality not as unfortunate like a car accident, but as an injustice that we have to work every single day to bring more people to the table, to build the type of campaigns and the strategies that change not just the culture, but force decision makers to be nervous, then we are not doing the work. And I want to say that in this moment where for the last several years, and I'm going to get political for one quick second. President Obama and even President Bush were change candidates. President Trump is a change the rules candidate. And that's a different type of archetype. Um, because the ideas of how we make change don't necessarily operate the same way. We have to think differently about how we move the strategies and the policies and the vision for a new world that we want to see. Because the idea that you um, judicial rulings will be implemented might not actually happen under a change the rules candidate. The idea that we get into a room and we hash out policy, we make compromises, some people are happy, some people are unhappy, but everyone's given a little, that doesn't actually operate the same way under the change the rules county. Let me uh, give you a little more. Uh, we may have disagreed with the politics of, let's say, a housing and urban development secretary, but we knew they knew something about housing and urban development. That's what change the rules can oftentimes do. And so, we have to get out of the magical thinking that makes us think that we can do a report and give people the facts, and all of a sudden they're gonna say, aha, I see the facts, let's, let's do the right thing. That our friends in Silicon Valley can write some code and all of a sudden we can act our way out of this. That we go into the courts, we do a case, and then everything is settled, and we've legaled our way out of it, or we can even start a nonprofit and nonprofit executive direct our way out of it. <laughs> it will require a new level of people power and narrative change to move ourselves out of this moment, and it will take us working collectively and across movements and across issues in ways that we have never imagined. It will take us recognizing that having faith in our ability to not just ensure that the most impacted are at the center of the conversation, but understanding that we're not doing it for charity, we are doing it for strategy. Because no movement in our country for social change has ever won without the most impacting being the writers of their own liberation. And a color of change, who was founded in the aftermath of a flood that was caused by bad decision makers, that turned into a life-altering disaster by those same bad decision makers, Hurricane Katrina. I still remember the images of black people on their roofs begging for the government to do something and being left to die. I see the same images in Puerto Rico right now. Katrina illustrated so much of what we know about geographic segregation, generational poverty, the impacts of climate change, what we've done to a whole set of systems. But at the heart of it, no one was nervous about disappointing black people. 
the government, corporations, and media. When institutions are not nervous about disappointing your community, it does not matter. So our work in this moment is to not just direct our marches at Trump as a change the rules candidate, but to direct our marches to those who for showing up as a march actually mean something. Sometimes to our allies, to corporate enablers, to those in government, because if we are not doing that work in this moment, if we are not doing the work to make those in power nervous about disappointing our community, we will continue to suffer and we will go down together. So I want to end by just once again thanking the United Church of Christ for leading. In this moment, we need large institutions like yours to create the culture in this country of challenging those who are guarding the systems and guarding the status quo. And it begins with those reaching out and seeing strategic action as imperative in the service for racial justice, gender justice, and justice for all people. That is how we transform this country, and that's how we will take this country back until justice is real.